Hey, everybody, and welcome to episode 244 of the JavaScript Jabber Show. This week on our panel, we have Joe Eames. Hey, everybody. Amy Knight. Hello. AJ O'Neill. Yo, yo, yo. Coming at you live and fighting for freedom at the home office of Dapley today. <laughs> you guys have a home office, or is that your home office? Oh, it's the office in my home. We're moving into an office next week, but we haven't been able to move into it yet. Awesome. Uh, I'm Charles Maxwood from DevChat.tv, and we have a new panelist, a new regular. It's so awesome. Corey, do you want to say <laughs> hi? Hi, everybody. I'm Corey House. Good to be here. Nice to uh, introduce him on the episode where he's not a panelist, but it's the guest. Good idea. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we planned that one real well. He's a panelist slash new... No. Guest slash new... Pa anyway. Um, so, yeah. So, uh, we are going to be talking today about uh, building a development environment. And it's interesting. You actually have a course on this on Pluralsight. That is correct. Uh, just published a couple weeks ago. So, do people need a course on this? I mean, part of me just thinks... Oh, well, you have a web browser, or maybe you install Node and run NPM, and then you get an editor and you're done, right? <laughs> well, I, I think it's funny you say that because um, this was one of those slow roll epiphanies that I had was that for for so long, I'd been starting off from scratch. And, you know, a few years ago, that really wasn't a big deal. You just slap some script tags on a page and it works. Um, and, I mean, we all know at some point that got rather untenable and uh, thankfully tooling has gotten much better since then. But what I've realized is um, we, we've shifted gears in the way that we we try to manage pain as JavaScript developers that we, we used to um, do this by leaning on a lot of libraries and, and NPM is, has been really helpful for making library consumption easy. But the thing that really, I feel like 2016 was characterized by a lot of people creating their own boilerplate starter kits, JavaScript development environments, uh, seeds. There, there's lots of terms for this idea, but the point is um, we're at this interesting place where everybody recognizes that getting started has gotten um, gotten to be overwhelming, that the number of decisions that you need to make is so significant that it's unrealistic for any professional to hold them all in their head. Uh, so th that's precisely what, um, what my new course is about is this uh, idea of being really methodical about how we move through the number of decisions that you make. Because um, the, the thing that I realized was there are literally dozens and dozens of de potential decisions to make if you uh, want to really um, be thorough, be diligent about considering all these things. And if you don't have, um, if your team doesn't have uh, your own development environment, then you will tend to just let a lot of these things fall to the floor. You'll miss important opportunities um, to make life easier and and also to programmatically enforce uh, quality in your JavaScript code base. Let's take a break from this episode and really quickly talk about finding a job. You know, searching for a job can feel stressful, scary, and time-consuming. Pushy recruiters try to sell you on roles you don't actually want, and the job boards make you feel like you're throwing your resume into a black hole never to be seen again. And sometimes you go all the way through an interview process just to find out that the very end that the salary offer or company culture doesn't match what you're looking for. Well, there's a solution. Hired.com is the world's most intelligent talent matching platform for full-time and contract opportunities. They make the job search faster, focused, and stress-free instead of endlessly applying to companies and hoping for the best. Hired puts you in control of how and when you connect with compelling opportunities. And after completing one simple application, top employers apply to you. And the best part is, is that you get money. That's right. They pay you if you get a job through them. Listeners to this show can earn double their normal hiring bonus by signing up with the show's link. That's right, you get $2,000 instead of $1,000. So go sign up at Hired.com slash JavaScript Jabber. Yeah, I kind of see this as a mix between like a style guide and standard operating procedures. 
And uh, the style guide sense of it is if everybody has the same environment set up, then you can make certain assumptions about the way that things are being written and you can help each other out more quickly because you don't have to figure out what they're doing. Um, and then the, the standard operating procedure part of it, it's funny you mentioned, you know, keep all this stuff in your head. Um, one of the big things that I've been doing for the podcasts and conferences lately is writing standard operating procedures. And it's just a checklist to make sure that all of the niggly little details got done. And mm -hmm. if you if you miss something, then it it's painful later sometimes, you know, where it's, oh, I totally forgot to set up the sign up page for a conference or, you know, oh, crap, you know, somebody forgot to share the podcast episode on Twitter or something. And that's where certain people look for it every week. And so, yeah, so by having these niggly little details just taken care of, you don't have to think about them. It's real nice. It's just check, 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 check. Okay, we're done. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I think the um, the thing that I realized was there was um, there were more decisions that were potentially there to be made than I had recognized until I actually sat down and wrote them out. So I, I will say, so for the course, I started going through previous projects that I had delivered and I looked at what pieces were in there and I said, okay, so here I did automated testing and linting and bundling. Um, I was minifying my code here. I didn't even think about things like bundle splitting. Uh, I didn't um, end up doing a good job on an automated build and et cetera. So what would happen is any given project would reach a certain level of quality based on really rather arbitrary uh, things that had popped into my head based on previous experiences. So I, I really think a, a team can benefit from coming together and deciding, okay, as a team, let's, let's make these decisions one time rather than on a project by project basis. I mean, we, we as an organization should be able to say that we have embraced ES Lint over JS Hint, which to me is a pretty easy decision. Um, but we shouldn't be asking those types of questions on a project by project basis in the same way questions about um, our testing framework about how we do minification about our stance on webpack versus browser five versus jspm um, i mean we all know that the the number of, of decisions that we make is huge but i came up with about 40 decisions that i thought were pretty key uh, for building a javascript development environment and that's Holy that's what yeah, it's it's kind of silly, uh, <laughs> but but I, I guarantee if I went through this list, I mean, the, the, the people on the show and the people listening would likely for the vast majority of it go, oh, well, yeah, that's true. I'd, I I'm familiar with those concepts, but I'm never sitting down before I write a line of code and asking myself consciously these 40 questions. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a big believer in uh, taking uh, a really proactive approach to this long conversation about fatigue and saying to me, the, the reason that we're fatigued is because of decision fatigue. And for most organizations, the application that you build today and build tomorrow is going to differ, but not differ so drastically that you need to completely reconsider your development environment experience. It, it will probably be largely the same. And you, for instance, are unlikely to end up um, moving from one test framework to the other or from Webpack back to Browserify. You can make some of these decisions up front and, and do them in a, a really repeatable way. All right, so I wanna ask a kind of an initial question, framing question here first off, and that is the target level of the audience, not, not necessarily just for the course, but almost just for this entire conversation here, right? And a little bit to your course as well is, is this the type of thing that if I'm a junior level developer, I'm just barely getting started, I'm hearing some of these words, but uh, I don't necessarily know the difference between Webpack and Browserify. Is this a course that would benefit me? Is this conversation going to benefit me? Or is this only the kind of thing that you need to worry about once you're the kind of the decision maker and it's like your job to set up the whole entire environment and you're maybe the senior dev on the team or something? No, I think that's a great question. So I, I would say in an ideal world, um, a team gets together and has these conversations that you don't have a single um, 
ivory tower uh, software architect that's making all these decisions and declaring to the team, this is what you will do. And these are the technologies you're forced to use. I'd, um, I'm a big believer in getting all the developers in a room in front of a whiteboard and just starting to go through the list and going through the merits of the different things. And we say, okay, yeah, Mocha is good. Seems like Jest is getting a lot of attention. W- what about uh, what about Chai? What assertion library do we want to do? And of course, these conversations take a while. But um, I, I think to your question of if you're a junior versus a senior who does these things, I mean, um, I will say that the course is is geared to beginner developers because effectively um, my conversation is, hey, you may not even be aware of all the options out there. So I'm going to show you that there's half a def- dozen different interesting ways to uh, just build a foundation on testing, that there's uh, uh, multiple different ways to think about uh, how to handle package managers or, or bundling or minification. Um, but I do believe that we're moving increasingly into a world where specialization is really important, where it's unrealistic for your entire team to be completely up to speed on all of this. So I do believe that it helps to have a specialist on your team that is willing to dive deep on some of these decisions and then come back and say, here's my professional recommendation. What does everybody think? I was actually going to ask that because so Joe brought up new people and yeah, they're not going to know what web, webpack browserify. It's like, you know, what language is this? You know, um, somebody just make up these terms. Yes. Um, but anyway, so they're, you know, what, what are the trade-offs? I mean, they're not going to know. They just want to use a tool and get the thing done. And then Mm -hmm. if if the thing that they're using, say they start out with Webpack, if Webpack uh, fails to handle some case that they have, then they'll go look at the other thing because they're new and they're much more interested in just getting crap done. And so, Mm -hmm. yeah, if if you're going through these 40 questions and you're looking at the the options, I mean, it almost feels like you ought to just be, you know, close your eyes and put your finger on the paper because you don't know what any of it means. So is there a good (laughs) guide for this? Well, it, it, so it sounds like a sales pitch, but that's um, that's precisely what my goal was in the course is um, I'm, I'm trying to do two core things. The, the first thing, my first goal is, is what I've talked about already here, which is selling you on the idea that you are sick and um, you need <laughs> you need help. Because <laughs> I, the, if I can if I can sell you on the fact that you're feeling pain and there is a solution, then life can get better. Um, I think a lot of people right now are complaining about the pain, but they're convinced that there's not really a, a very good solution beyond telling people to stop innovating, to say, hey, stop creating new frameworks and libraries because none of us can keep track. And I, I feel like the, the real solution is as a team. Um, make these decisions and then uh, except for the fact except the fact that every quarter or so you might rally for a bit and say hey is there anything in here that uh, we've changed our minds about but at any given time you have this canonical development environment starter kit whatever term you'd like to use um, that tells everybody hey here's how we do javascript development at our company on this team Um, so that that is really powerful but my, my other goal in there is to move through the different decisions one by one and then enumerate every single option. So for instance, okay, you need a development web server. Well, should you use a browser sync? Should you go ahead and use express for that? Should you use um, HTTP server, some really lightweight solution? Um, For every one of these decisions, there's uh, at least a half dozen different options. So I walk through those and talk about um, the merits of each. Um, So so that somebody brand new can come in and at least get a a high level view of the entire JavaScript ecosystem. But on the same token, somebody that's been doing this for years can come in and probably find two or three things in any given section that they hadn't really looked into or considered before. So although it's a beginner oriented course, I think um, anybody could probably walk away um, with new pieces and um, along the way from any given module. Now, but what do you ha- what do you do about the fact that since we started this call, um, we've had both a new linter and a new module loader get released that nobody knew about. <laughs> and three web frameworks and a pear tree. Yeah. And a pear tree. <laughs> oh, that's a, that's a fine point. Um, <laughs> You know, well, I mean, uh, obviously you say that in jest, but it, th- things are moving. It feels um, that way. It does. Oh, it's a new yeah. week. There's new stuff out there that's going to be really cool that I don't have time to look at. I, I'm completely cognizant to it. I will tell you, I was just about to publish. Um, I had literally turned in the module on um, 
package managers. And then yarn was announced right after I recorded. And I went, oh, great. <laughs> oh, and I mentioned nothing about yarn. So now should I go back and do that? And do I want to do that? Because yarn isn't necessarily a new package manager so much as just a different way of interacting with NPM. So, uh, do, do I want to confuse beginners with this extra? It's really a nice to have, not a have to have for most people. Um, so I, I mean, I, to I totally see your point, um, that, there, there's no changing the speed that this train is moving on, but the way that we keep up is by trying to set as much foundation as possible. And for instance, um, so here we are, Webpack 2 is coming out in the next week or so, um, officially out of release candidate. So that that is um, a fairly big shift, but I'm guessing that those are on Webpack 1 won't have a big problem moving to 2. Mm -hmm. And, and so... The, there, while there are things constantly shifting, the the huge huge pieces like moving from Angular to React move more on an annual to biannual basis uh, for teams than things like moving from one testing framework to another or one linting framework to another. So it's it's really not it's not near as scary as I think um, Joe paints it. Although I know Joe's Joe's doing it for fun anyway. I I often feel the same way. Well, and I think ultimately, I mean, for new people, you you kind of just have to show them the path, right? And so if you're showing them the path with good options, I think you're fine. If you know, for for other people who are out there who are looking for another solution to their problem or are, are looking for another. Uh, way of doing this thing or want to be on the cutting edge of the new technology that solves a particular problem. I mean, you know, they're, they're not going to find their thing in your list and that's fine. But if you, Can I mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. No, you're fine. I was just going to say <laughs> but for, you know, for, for the general person who's not out there trying to pick out the new innovations, you know, having good options in there and having most of the options I'm going to pick in there are fine. Mm -hmm. I, I kind of wanted to ask a question because I do feel like I talked to a lot of my friends, um, you know, I haven't been in this situation because I've always been working on like an existing code base, but I have quite a few friends who um, like finished a boot camp and they start out at an agency and they actually are sometimes tasked with setting up a project from scratch and without having the context that comes from experience, you know, that can be pretty daunting and pretty difficult. So I guess my question is your course, how much do you get into, you know, not necessarily like choose A or B, but like things that you should consider, like the thought process you should take when you're making these decisions? Oh, so, so that's very much the conversation throughout, because for, for instance, when I'm making a decision um, between choosing um, NPM versus JSPM, that, that is a decision that is um, has some specific implications. And we have to talk about the merits of each um, when, when we talk about decisions in, in testing or any of these um, tooling decisions, um, we have to get to both sides. And in fact, that's where, uh, oddly I come out with at the end of the, the course, each time I make a decision, I implement it into, uh, the starter kit. So we're starting off with a completely blank space and we say NPM init, let's start adding things in here, adding features along the way and seeing this thing grow. Um, but as I talk about things like the fact that I'm reaching for NPM scripts instead of grunt or gulp, now this is my personal preference, but I want to be clear why it's my personal preference. And um, the, the, the reason that it's a challenging course is when you get into those preferences, um, you, you have to be able to talk about the specific reasons that you made all these decisions. And a lot of the time we made these decisions because that's what our team did or because that was the popular choice. So, um, I, it, this took me many months to put together because I realized I had to justify a lot of decisions that I had more or less made because I tend to lean toward the popular choice. Um, and, and, and I think for a lot of people, if you're, if you're feeling torn, popularity is a pretty good metric because at the very least, if it's popular, you're going to find a, a lot of help on Stack Overflow. You'll find probably more responsiveness and issues on GitHub. And that goes a long way. Um, so it, it's a complicated decision, but um, those are part of the, the metrics that I use. Totally. And I mean, 
mean, let's not like kid ourselves. We are very blessed that we're in a job that we get to work on fun stuff like that. But the thing I was going to say, just to what you're saying, you know, it sounds like what you're saying is very much like what's been instilled into me with a lot of my mentors is like, there really are no like absolutes and there are mm-hmm. just pros and cons to everything. And you have to get good at weighing those pros and cons and not seeing things as black and white as we as developers kind of tend to like to do. So yeah, I, I totally agree. I want to jump into a uh, dig a little bit more into your statement about popularity, um, which I don't, by any means disagree with. So popularity is a reasonable measurement of what you could or potentially be using, right? For the exact criteria that you've been talking about. When do you make the decision not to go with popularity? What might be criteria to consider that, hey, this is the most popular thing right now, but I either want to either even just think about using something else, right? Or uh, I really do want to use something else. What might be some criteria for that? Uh, wow. So that's a good question. I, I was just thinking through times when I've chosen the less popular. So, so a couple things. I, I remember when I moved to React very, very early on when it was completely clear that as a, a company, as a developer in a .NET shop, uh, I was going to be standing out like a sore thumb. I was making a very unpopular decision to suggest us working in React when everybody else felt like Angular was just an automatic decision. So um, I had to convey exactly why. And the the way that I had gotten there was by building applications in Angular and uh, building the exact same application in React and then starting to walk through how that experience differed. Because I was at a point where I I could see that there was a lot of excitement at, com- at conferences, so I wanted to understand exactly what the buzz was about. And I, I don't think there, there's any shortcut to trying it on your own and understanding whether you're looking at mere marketing fluff or genuine changes that will make your life better. I mean, I, I went through the same thing with uh, the move from Grunt to Gulp to NPM scripts, where uh, you know, Gulp was something that I was really excited about to the point that I was evangelizing at, at conferences and doing conference talks. And then one day I'd read a blog post about NPM scripts that made me rethink that. So I went ahead and rewrote my app to use that instead. And I started comparing the two. So, you know, like a lot of things, it's um, t- to me, let the rubber meet the road, um, get in there and actually try it and then start writing down the merits of the two. I tend to, I tend to blog about these things and my experiences because it helps me collect my thoughts. Um, one particular metric that I've often used and I want to get your take on is what about just, uh, I don't know if consensus might be the right word, but like trusted advisors, other people on the internet that you really, uh, trust their opinion. How do you use that as a metric for reconsidering what you're doing? Well, you know, this is a, <laughs> I think this is a very interesting question because for, for instance, um, somebody could find themselves very easily in an echo chamber. Uh, and this happens in politics as well. You could say, okay, I'm going to choose my political views based on the people that I follow on Twitter. And Hey, what do you know? I tend to follow a lot of people on Twitter with the same political views as me. Cause we, we like to hear things we agree with. And in the same token, this can happen in technology. We stop following certain people because we realize, well, I, I disagree with you on this. You're, you're big and object oriented. I'm big into functional, or I like this framework versus this framework. Um, so I, I have definitely tried to be diverse in the people that I follow on Twitter and not to unfollow somebody merely because they work in a different technology stack than I do, or because they have different technological opinions. Um, there, in fact, and in fact, there are some people that I follow that I find rather brash and abrasive that very strongly disagree with me, but I follow them because they often have really, um, thoughtful content. Um, so I like being challenged and I think we all have that opportunity to do so. Um, but it, it definitely is, um, it definitely takes some self-control, uh, in some cases to avoid just muting people because they disagree with, um, your, your current preferences. Yeah. One thing that I'm just going to chime in here with though, is that, you know, you have all these decisions to make and people are talking about all of their different decisions. So they're talking about using Webpack and they're talking about using NPM scripts or Gulp or Grunt or what have you. And so 
you know, I, I get overwhelmed all over again because there's new stuff about it. Um, so do you recommend to people that they only go and look up information about the decisions they're trying to make? Or are there other bits of, of advice you have for staying on top of these things without getting overwhelmed with all the things? This episode is sponsored by Frontend Masters. Engineers have watched over 2 million hours of Frontend Masters videos to upgrade their skills in the latest best practices in frontend development and Node.js. Popular video courses of theirs include courses on Advanced JavaScript, Angular 2, React, API Design with Node, and Functional and Asynchronous JavaScript. Many of their teachers have even been guests on JavaScript Jabber. Check them out at frontendmasters.com. So do you recommend to people that they only go and look up information about the decisions they're trying to make? Or are there other bits of, of advice you have for staying on top of these things without getting overwhelmed with all the movement out there? Uh, well, so I, I think if you're, somebody, if you're somebody that's starting at square one, um, taking someone else's starter kit, boilerplate, um, and beginning from there can be useful at the very least for reverse engineering it and seeing how they put it together and then building yours from the ground up. Uh, I think if you look at, if you look in the angular space, look in the react space, um, there are so many boilerplates out there, um, that that's a new sense of overwhelm, um, just choosing from those. Uh, but you can at least find a good stable starting point and, um, use those opinions to get you started. Uh, th th there's a, a quote by Derek Sivers that, um, I really admire where he talks about the value of opinions. And he says that, you know, sharing opinions is naturally valuable that me sharing my opinion is useful because if you don't really have a, a strong foot to stand on to start with, you can take my opinion and just run with it. Maybe you don't care that much, or maybe you're just getting started and you can say, okay, well, so-and-so had this opinion. I'll use that as my starting point. But if you are farther along and you have your own views, now you at least have an, um, something to bounce ideas off of. You have something to contrast with and you can use my opinion as a starting point for your rebuttal. But now both of us can help make each other stronger. So that, that's precisely what these, these boilerplates and starter kits do is say, okay, here's my opinion on how to get started. And I find it very interesting. Uh, you know, obviously I follow the React um, ecosystem most closely, but uh, what was it? It was mid last year when I created uh, React Slingshot, which was my starter kit. And it became popular much to my surprise because I'd put it out there at a pretty good time when there weren't very many starter kits. Now, fast forward to today, there's, there's over a hundred that are published on Andrew Farmer's website and it becomes difficult just to choose among them all. Um, but there's, there's this recognition that a lot of people, um, feel that pain, but they also on the same token, many, many React starter kits have literally thousands and thousands of stars on GitHub because people have found them useful as yet another example of how to bake bread. It's, well, this person used a little more yeast or a little less flour, whatever may be. I don't know how to make bread. I hope those are ingredients in bread. But <laughs> that's that's the the big idea is the, the usefulness of contrasting people's approaches. So <clears throat> question that I have there are some technologies where there's a clear win and it isn't really a matter of opinion, right? Like we went from Microsoft ha. source save ha. to CVS <laughs> from CVS to CSV, see whatever it was called version controls, VCS anyway, to SVN, SVN to get. And through that lineage, people are pretty like unanimous. Like, yes, this is better than the previous thing. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think that anybody who started using Git for a month went back and like, well, you know, SVN is better because, and, and, and you know, same thing. So why is it that in the JavaScript community, there aren't clear wins and there are people that go and try something and they're like, ah, well, the old thing was better. What, what's the difference between these two types of paradigms of technologies where the win is clear and it's just a battle round. Hmm. So I would be, so here's a question for everybody on the panel here. Are there any clear wins in JavaScript? And if so, what are they? Cause I, I do feel like some have definitely happened. Um, and I feel like some are, are currently in, 
progress, but does anybody feel like there's, there's some more or less clear winners given there are still competitors playing out there, but as community, some decisions have more or less uh, coalesced. So I'm just going to chime in here because I feel like, and I know we're going to get some dissent <laughs> from the panel, right? but uh, I, I feel like a lot of the ES6 TypeScript type things offer a lot of clear wins. I know it depends some on what you're building, but out there for the web, if you have a decent build system in place, um, those in a lot of ways make things a lot easier. I mentioned this a while back on um, one of our episodes. I'm not remembering which one it was now, but I think, uh, I mean, not I think, like this is obviously very clear. No matter what framework you go with, I mean, just within the past year or maybe like a year and a half, like it is very clear that we want to follow like a component pattern rather than mm -hmm. have like MBC on the front end or something like that. So whether you're with Angular 1 and you're like on 1.5 or you're Angular 2 or you're React, you any of that like that's a very clear winner hmm. i think that's i think i could give like, co good counterpoints to both of those i i think there are but uh, to amy's point i think it's interesting you're, you're saying just having a framework um and i think a lot of people would consider that you know well which one which one should win but just making the decision to use one you're saying that's a win well, not Amy, that wasn't Amy's point. I think that's an interesting point to use one versus not. I think I could still give some fairly compelling arguments against even using a framework. Now, that doesn't necessarily, like, there's two reasons why people consider something to be a clear win. One, because some, the other option just goes completely out of vogue. That doesn't necessarily mean that it actually was a bad option. It just, everybody stops using it, right? right? And they consider it to be old, but that doesn't necessarily mean it could be a clear win. For example, right? Um, ES6 really only compiles well down to ES5, right? If you want to compile down to ES3, major problems. Yet there is a still, a, depending on what kind of an application you're producing, targeting ES3 might be really important to you, right? If whatever you're doing has to do with um, people in third world countries, they could be using Windows 95 and stuck on an ES3 browser, right? They could still be doing it that so that could be really important um mm -hmm. so i mean there's certainly other counterpoints like i know plenty of people who feel like the existing frameworks that are out there just are not good enough and it's better to hand roll your own i mean i guess that's still a framework but going with something based off of jquery is still better than using one of the existing frameworks for various reasons right um so there are some, definitely some counterpoints. How, Corey, what, what would you say when somebody comes along and says something like, now, I don't know if you would disagree on the ES3 versus ES5 decision, right? But let's say the, uh, maybe this one does seem like a clear win is use a framework if you're doing JavaScript development. Um, <laughs> what, would you, what would you say to that? I, I guess here's another counterpoint to that and, that, and that is, hey, I'm using Rails or I'm using ASP.NET. I don't need a framework on the front end because I can do everything with, uh, you know, partial page refreshes uh, that are built into the my framework mm -hmm. so well, and I, something like that go ahead well I, I think it's interesting that you, your examples are legitimate and i agree there are exceptions but i think what we were really talking about is this question started of why aren't we seeing really clear winners and i, I felt like I, I tend to agree with amy that we have seen that that people, the community has decided ES6 is a big win and, and by and large people are using it because the, the cases where you cannot use it are very, a very small percentage. And there'll always be these, these exceptions where somebody has to support a really old browser or a really old operating system. Those two tend to run hand in hand. Um, and because of that, they can't do what is, is popular in the mainstream. But uh, I, I can think of, uh, I, I feel like we, we decided <laughs> quite a while ago that um, NPM is the package manager. I mean, you, there, are, there is Jam and Volo and JSPM out there, but NPM is pretty well, everybody's coalesced there. It's become the largest package manager in the world. So, so big win there. I think when we look at, um, at bundlers, there's been this, this fight between um, JSPM and Browserify and Webpack and Rollup. And I see the communities coalescing pretty heavily on Webpack now to, to the point that we're seeing people supporting Webpack month to month um, because 
it um, it does so much. It is so comprehensive that we might as well put our eggs in that basket. And despite the fact that it's hard to learn, uh, it it offers so many wins that the uh, the large majority are reaching for it now. Um, so are these now, things happening because of objective reasons or because it's just kind of what it, where everybody's what everybody's doing, right? We're all following I, the livings. I <laughs> clarify maybe what I meant a little bit. The only point I was trying to make was just that no matter what framework, if you choose to go with a framework, um, which I feel like if you're a front end developer, most front end developers are using a framework because you have a more complex app, maybe not like a full stack person. Uh, but if you are a front end developer, like the point I was just trying to make is that all the frameworks seem to be converging on this like component pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you know, as someone who has worked in React and I've worked in Angular 1.5, I've played around a little bit with Angular 2 just in my free time, like as much as we like to think that they're very, very, very different, like there are, they, they are coming, becoming closer and closer and closer together. Yeah, I, the similarities are a lot more than the dif differences, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's one thing that I think is, is probably most exciting when you look at the framework space, you are seeing Angular and Ember and React continue to borrow ideas from each other. I mean, you saw Ember pretty quickly um, took uh, React's idea of, of the virtual DOM and put in a, a, a Glimmer rendering engine that made things much, much faster. Um, you see uh, unidirectional data flows catching on in other places. You see um, Angular's uh, directives end up... Um, becoming the precursor to this component model. So yeah, I, I think, I think while, while the tooling continues to churn a lot, we're seeing the big ideas um, end up getting passed between all the big players. And so we, I feel like we're getting closer and closer to something that will, will stabilize. We're still a really uh, young industry and JavaScript in particular is, is quite young and that's part of why it moves so fast. But, you know, I, I get really excited by the, the component model uh, in particular. I think we've got a, a really bright future there, despite the fact that, you know, a lot of us are going to be creating uh, framework specific components when it would be nice if we were creating plain old, uh, standards-based web components, uh, but that's that's for another show. Uh, so I, I, I still I still feel like uh, the glass is half full uh, on on this story because you can shift gears and move between these different frameworks and libraries and find that many of the concepts are just being used again under perhaps a slightly different API or a different branding name. Well said. So I have a question for you. Um, you've talked about making these decisions, right? You kind of pick the tools that you're going to use and answer all these 40 questions. So, um, you know, I, I've got my list now. It's about as long as my arm, the tools that I'm going to use. So now do I go in and actually edit my file so that uh, NPM installs know what knows what to pull in? Or is there some easier way to get all the stuff that I want in there? Well, so there's... Um there's two decisions here. There's one decision of, okay, I'm starting from scratch and I'm going to create our team's starter kit. Um, and, and for that, uh, the way that we flowed was I literally just started from square one and started pulling in things that I liked. And what, what I did was went out as a React developer and said, I'm going to go look at every existing starter kit and look at what they're doing, see, take what I like, um, ignore what I don't like, and then add in all the things that I see that are missing until I get something that I'm proud of. And uh, now given last summer, that was easier to do because there was a shorter list of things for me to look at. Today, you'd have to be more selective than that and, and make some base decisions up front. Um, but nonetheless, what's really exciting right now is that you can probably uh, take two or three of the more popular kits and get... Um, get an awesome foundation and then start tweaking from there. Now, the separate decision that needs to be made, which is equally important, is how do we keep things updated down the road? Um, because if you end up, for instance, just taking a, a GitHub repo and saying, hey, whenever you start a new package, just fork this or start a new project, just fork this uh, GitHub repository and, and start from there. What you find is those 
projects six months later, there's no easy way to get those updated to your latest reality. When you find that you made mistakes in the past, that there are some some bugs in your build scripts or that a lot of these packages have had breaking changes and don't interact well with you. Um, that's where it gets painful. So uh, what we've done is followed the model that um, Create React App uses and a number of other um, starter kits are, are starting to take on as well, which is why don't we take everything that we do and put it in a single NPM package? So if, if you look at, at my team starter kit today, it's it's kind of overwhelming, but there's are literally a uh, hundred NPM package references in the starter kit. But when you use our starter kit, you have one reference because that our starter kit encapsulates all those NPM packages, all the associated NPM scripts, all of the, the separate JS build files that make things happen, our Babel config, our ESLint config, and so on into a single NPM package. And the beauty of that is five months from now, when somebody's wanting to update their app, I can just say, go get the latest version of our starter kit. All you do is change one line in your package.json and now you get um, all your latest package references, you get any updates to build scripts and um, the magic just continues to work. So that that for us has been uh, a huge win for long-term maintainability over uh, just copying and pasting files from a sort of a scaffold style starter kit. All right, um, so I guess my question is um, you pull in uh, so I go to my package.json, I put in query starter kit, npm install, it puts everything in place, but like um, GitHub repo names, uh, which project to push to for my CI and things like that, those are all going to be different. So is there some kind of setup script that you set up in there as well? Or is it just kind of a, okay, now your next step is go edit these couple of files so that we know where stuff is? Yeah, that, so that's a good point. Um, at least with us, we expect people to do that manually. And, and the reason that we have done that, frankly, is just I haven't gotten to it yet. If you look at interesting tools like Create React App, they uh, literally prompt you with that information. Uh, so I, I think that's a good way to go. Um, we've been pulling in a lot of good ideas from uh, different starter kits, and that's how ours has um, gotten to mature pretty quickly without us having to do uh, a lot of our own work. But there, there is this... Um, there is definitely uh, an opportunity there to prompt people up front for those things that differ. The, okay, where's your repo? Uh, what do you want to name the project? What directory do you want to put it in? And so on and so forth. Um, so, and, and that's not particularly difficult to do with NPM anyway. Um, it's just honestly not something that um, we've done yet. It, I think the decision on whether it's worthwhile comes down to how often you're, you're spinning up new projects too. Right. Can we um, can I ask another question on a slightly different attack? Uh, obviously, I love the idea of this uh, course that you've put out, which is kind of enumerates the choices to make, which is awesome. Because so a lot of times you feel like you just don't know what you don't know, right? Mm -hmm. And have something like this available to help you identify what don't I know and what do I care enough about to really dig into deep. But there's a huge other class. It sounds like this is a little bit targeted towards, all right, I'm setting up my JavaScript development environment for a project. But what about the class where we have an existing application and there's all that churn that happens with, that gets people irate, which is, hey, we're now using this, I don't know, package manager, for example, that's starting to get less popular. So somebody over the weekend goes around and changes it and you might be using something more up to date, but now you have developers that this on the team who don't know about it and don't understand it. And if you do that too often, you create unnecessary churn, but if you don't do it often enough, you end up using really outmoded technologies. How do you <laughs> find good balance points for keeping an existing project's ancillary tools? You know, not the core thing. You're not, probably not gonna change from Angular to React in the middle of a big project without a lot of some huge effort, but this is just like maintenance mode, right? We're still building it. We're six months in and now this tool that we chosen, it's not really working or it fall, it's fallen out of popularity. It's, how do you balance all that out? 
I wish I knew the answer to that. I think that's what is currently making my job hard is, um, you know, once you become very popular, you, you recognize, okay, now we have a half dozen consumers of the starter kit. And if I make a change, for instance, right now, I'm wanting to move from, from Mocha to Jest, uh, because Jest has really become uh, a really slick way to uh, do testing in react. Um, but that does mean that existing anybody using uh, our old setup on Mocha has to rewrite their test to be able to upgrade to the latest. So you, um, you have some conversations that you have to have there on the merits of it for, for each decision you make, you have to say, is the juice worth the squeeze in this case? And that, um, those are painful conversations. Uh, I, I completely agree with you though, that there's a balancing act here that, um, obviously you, you can't just stay put, or you'll become irrelevant, but you also can't change on a weekly basis or people will get um, <laughs> completely consumed with just trying to keep up. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I feel like a, uh, you know, a conversation every quarter or so is realistic given the, the pace of things. And it doesn't have to be a very long one. And most of those changes in there should be uh, rather minor API changes. But the, the large tooling changes, those those should happen more on a, a, a biannual type of basis or maybe annual basis, uh, depending how how fast you as an organization want to adopt the latest and greatest. And are there any good criteria for making those considerations and changes? You know, imagine that this is my first project that I'm really the kind of the guy in charge and making the decisions on. And all of a sudden I'm a little nervous about doing it too often and not doing it often enough. And I've got other developers that depend on me. How can I, are there, are there any easy criteria litmus tests that I can say, all right, we should reconsider this because, um, you know, I, th I heard of one person on Twitter saying it or because everybody in the world is telling me that, oh, I should definitely not be using this tool anymore. Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, as, as far as criteria goes, uh, I, I think the one thing that I'm looking for is, is there a specific pain point that we're feeling today that this change would solve? Uh, and and that is a really key piece. And in fact, that, that's the very thing that I ask anybody that, that's listening to this conversation at all. You know, if, if you as a J JavaScript development uh, team aren't feeling any pain with your current setup today, then okay, this show's not for you. But if you are feeling pain as in every time we start a new project, we get in long arguments about all the things that should be in there, or we realize after we went to production that we really should have considered X, Y, and Z, then that's, that's what this is for. So in the same way, you know, the move from say gulp to NPM scripts for me was a win for some specific reasons. But if I already had uh, a huge investment in Gulp, the difference between the two is probably not significant enough to justify spending a lot of time making that transition because it is not that that transition enabled anything that was impossible before or made work an order of magnitude faster than it was. It just, that move for me removed some friction that I was previously feeling. So effectively there's this balance between if it is something that I can do that has a really low impact to everybody, then that's a pretty low bar. I can make the move even if it's just a minor win, but if it has a large impact to people, a breaking change requires a lot of training, uh, requires us touching a lot of existing apps and rather tricky ways, then it's got to clear a very high bar. I have to be able to effectively make everybody else comfortable that I, we're going to get a really big win in velocity or security or performance to justify my move. And those sorts of things honestly, although we're moving very quickly, they don't happen that often. And that's precisely why you're going to continue to see lots of organizations still, still running older frameworks and libraries, because you know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Excellent advice. Excellent advice. Anything else that we should attack on this before we go to picks? I think it's I, I have a question. Really interesting. So go ahead. Yeah. Sorry, Chuck. Uh, as you were doing, putting this course together, Corey, what were the things, I mean, you're an experienced developer, right? You've been around, you've seen a lot of stuff. You go and put those courses together. What were the things that surprised you about putting this together? Anything specific? 
Oh, sure. So, so the single biggest surprise for me was that uh, I was making a lot more decisions than I realized. And for the most part, I was making those decisions without thinking much of it. I was cargo culting. I was doing what everybody else was doing without being able to explain why. And that was what was the, the most challenging piece of this course was, was going back through and, and justifying the whys along the way. Uh, the other thing that surprised me was there were a lot of cases where there were options out there that I literally hadn't considered. There were pieces that needed to be part of my development environment that I had never set up before, and but that now today I will uh, use probably by default. So one example is this, that I'd never really considered uh, the usefulness of a mock API. And so I started to dive into this topic. And then I realized that there are some really awesome JavaScript tools out there that um, I could pull up JSON server that I could define a schema that declares uh, what I want, what realistic data I want to generate for my application. So we're in this awesome place today where my team has been tasked with building a UI, but the API team isn't going to have any time to do it until next quarter. So they need us to completely build the UI and then we'll just hand it over to them and they'll, they'll wire up the API. Well, to be able to do that in a way that's really realistic, you need a realistic API behind the scenes. So it just so happened that I'd done that for the course and I had um, this knowledge here and we found it to be super luxurious because you use things like JSON server and you can make um, RESTful API calls and it completely simulates a relational database behind the scenes just using a plain old uh, JSON file. So it will write to that file when I write new records. It will delete from that file when I uh, delete records and it puts this um, sort of JSON style API in front of it. So we've, we have an application that feels completely real. You would think there's a database behind the scenes and it's there's not. And all I do is type npm start and my linting runs, my testing runs, my dev web server spins up, my mock API starts, it opens in a default browser and we're off to the races. So it's a really luxurious way way uh, to write code. So that, I mean, that was what I always found was um, when I started digging more, I realized, you know, that's just one example of something that I could have been doing um, all along to make life easier, but it just hadn't crossed my mind until I thought about all the things that maybe should be in a good JavaScript development environment. And there's this, um, there's this book that I read um last year called the checklist manifesto and i highly recommend it to, to javascript developers this can be uh, one of my picks um, and, and the beauty of this book is just pointing out the power of creating checklists the power of making sure that things get done um, because professionals need checklists we we shouldn't assume that we can hold it all in our heads there's just too many things there and that's precisely what a development environment does for you all this code is codifying these decisions and it's making sure that it all gets done programmatically anything else <laughs> I, I want to ask one more question, actually, I just thought of. Okay. So, um, recently, we did a little uh, survey to determine how important various aspects of a product was to people. And almost everyone said that price was important to them. But in actuality, if you think about... Well, it's basically, it's like one-time cost versus subscription cost over time, da, 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 blah, blah. There's cost benefit. It's like the rent versus own kind of scenario, right? Like people will claim that renting is cheaper if that's what they emotionally like. And people will claim that owning is cheaper if that's what they emotionally like. But either one is true in a particular case. And I'm wondering, Corey, if you find um, interesting cases as you've been doing this study where uh, you find similar arguments where people really, they say one thing, like, I like it because it's cheaper. I like it because it's faster. I like it because it's whatever. But in actuality, the data doesn't really show that one is particularly better than the other, except in this particular circumstance or that particular circumstance. Hmm. Well, so the, the first example that comes to mind for me was 
the contrast between Grunt and Gulp and NPM scripts, this idea that NPM scripts didn't scale, that the people that used Gulp felt strongly that, yeah, sure, you can do simple things with NPM scripts, but you can't do complex things, that putting a few scripts within package.json is obviously not going to scale well. You can't comment it. It's, it's um, not really comparable in the real world. And what I found was that, you know, um, that was one of those examples of people taking their natural preferences and not digging a bit deeper on seeing the scalability approaches that you can take in that world instead. Um, the, uh, the quote that comes to mind here, um, I, I just read it yesterday and, and it really hit me uh, by Charlie, Charlie Munger had said that um, you shouldn't take an opinion on a matter until you can argue the other side as well as the best people on that side can. And that's um, part of what I had to go through was saying, okay, there, there's, there's big fans in a lot of these technologies that um, honestly, I have, I have decided uh, to pick alternatives instead, but I have to be able to argue the merits of these alternatives as well. Um, so that forces you to, to dig deeper. Uh, and, and I think that's a really good exercise for everybody. That That's part of what's super valuable about this. I mean, if, if you take nothing else from, from this conversation, I suggest set up a meeting maker with your team. And for the meeting maker, really, there's two questions I would suggest that you ask. First, as a JavaScript development team, what are our pain points that we're feeling today? And could we remove a lot of those pain points by creating a starter kit? Um, so then we could start to have those conversations um, because th that will force you to, to look at both sides of the story. It'll, it'll force people that have otherwise just chosen by default to justify their decisions to the team. Cool. Let's pause for a moment to talk about our sponsor, Taurus. Taurus is a new tool for managing and securing the secret information that allows your app to run. You know the stuff, passwords, API keys, database credentials, all the stuff that gives access to the private stuff that you don't want anybody to touch except for your application in specific ways. Taurus provides a convenient way to store all this information in the cloud, and they can't access it because it's encrypted with material derived from your password, which is never transmitted to their server. So it's secured from them, from everybody else, but accessible to you. This means only the servers, development machines, and applications you've allowed can access the information. So make secrets management headaches a thing of the past and check out Taurus today. You can find them at devchat.tv slash Taurus. That's devchat.tv slash T-O-R-U-S. All right, let's go ahead and get to those picks. Joe, do you want to start us off with picks? I picked you on I'd purpose the first this time because <laughs> on Adventures in Angular last week. Yeah, sure. I'm uh, I'm I'm just fine going first. All right. Uh, so I want to pick what I believe is the coolest named conference I have heard in so long, which is NG Vikings. Uh, it's a Angular conference happening in Denmark. And what an awesome name, NG Vikings. I'm actually going to be there. I'm going to giving, be giving a free workshop on migrating from Angular 1 to Angular 2. Oh, wait, it's Angular 4. Um, I don't even know. So <laughs> the latest version, from Angular 1 to the latest version, the, to the other Angular that isn't Angular 1. <laughs> and uh, Angular I'll be, it'll, Yes, Angular. I want to call it an Angular Next, right? <laughs> So um, anyway, uh, I'll be giving a free workshop, uh, all day workshop on it, like six hours long. So that'll be fun. But I just I love Denmark and I also think Vikings are pretty freaking awesome. So I'm excited about that. So I pick that. And my other pick is going to be my wife. And there are so many reasons I could pick my wife. <laughs> but there's one very specific reason, and that is she got me the NES Classic when it is almost impossible oh, to find. Oh, dude. Yep. Nice. <laughs> she picked it up for me for Christmas. It's so impossible to find. And she spent her hard-earned money and paid, you know, quite a bit extra for it from some guy that was snatching them up, must have had some inside scoop and selling them for a big profit. But uh, she was she knew that I wanted it and picked it up for me for Christmas. So 
I'm going to pick her. And uh, I also uh, want to mention that by the time this is out, I'm pretty sure it will be published. My new course on Angular 2 Fundamentals will be out. But I'm actually really excited to check out Corey's course on setting up your JavaScript environment, just seeing that list, right? Then it'll be, do you, do you, do you actually get, give the list of the 40 items at like at any point in the course? Oh yes, I do. That that's very early in the course. That's my little hook to keep people from turning it off. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, well, I'm re I'm really excited to check that out. So, those are my picks. Awesome, AJ. What are your picks? So I'm going to pick Simple Bank, which is just simple.com, and the reason is I like them. And one of the reasons I like them is when they have to do things that are really businessy, technically technical e things, like inform you that their underlying bank is being transferred from one platform to another platform and everybody has to migrate. Their email comes in and it says stuff like rabble, 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 legal jargon we have to tell you. And what was the other one I got? It's time to move your account. Yay. Also, they don't have any fees, um, at least none that I'm aware of. If you slide your debit card and there's not enough money in the account, it just doesn't work. Instead of charging you $70 in fees and stacking them in reverse order so that you have to pay like that $70 six times. So uh, if, you, if you like the idea of an online bank and you don't mind having to pull cash out of an ATM at a 7-Eleven um, and, and scanning in your checks rather than handing them to a teller, then I would highly recommend Simple Bank. Um, and also, uh, self-pick, Dapply, we're taking back the internet. We're doing okay, I think. Our Indiegogo has gone well. It's about to end. People won't have the opportunity to contribute by the time they hear this. But we are looking for people that want to take back the internet with us. So if you have any interest in that, send an email to jobs at dapply.com. And uh, at this stage, we're looking for people that have various skill sets and that kind of believe in the ideas we believe in and would like to uh, be equity owners in the company. There you go. Those my your chance to own AJ. Yes. Yes. All right, Amy, what are your picks? Okay. I have two. So the first one, I'm going to mention another podcast on this podcast, but, um, I listen to software engineering daily quite a bit too. And one episode in particular, this is from a while back it's from November 19th. Uh, but it's debugging stories. Uh, I just, I love hearing this kind of stuff. So, um, that's a really, really, really good episode, fun episode to listen to. Uh, so I'll put a link for that in the show notes. And then another one, I listened to front end happy hour. Uh, we had Brian Holt on a while back. I don't think that episode is aired yet, but, um, <clears throat> he picked something which is really, really cool. Uh, it's called quick draw and it looks like it's from Google, but basically, it just uses like neural networks and so machine learning and all that fun stuff. Uh, but it's an, it's a app and you can like draw on your phone and it'll predict what you're drawing. So it's like really fun to play with. It'd be a good thing. Uh, I know this will come out after the holidays, but it would have been a good thing to play with like your nieces and nephews or people around the table at Christmas or something. Anyways, that's it for me. All right. Corey, do you have some picks for us? Yes, I do. I got two here. Uh, my first pick is a book that I just finished called Ego is the Enemy by Ryan Holiday. Uh, oh, I've heard really, think about that. <laughs> I, I have kept hearing about it. I've been really excited to read it for a long time. It's a short read. It's only 200 pages, but um, really good for um, people like me and uh, other other humans that have struggled with, uh, you know, questioning exactly why I push so hard. So it's really got me thinking deeply about why I do what I do. And I think that's a very important question for people to ask. And especially if you find yourself getting down to the point where you realize, you know, I think this is mostly about ego, about maybe trying to impress people. Maybe, maybe I should rethink um, what I'm doing and uh, focus more on things that um, have more inherent value than, than merely that. It's a really wonderful book, though, very challenging. I've been in a philosophical mood. So my other recommendation is a very short blog post um, on Farnham Street, um, 
that was written by Hunter S. Thompson when he was 22 years old. And it's called Letter on Finding Your Purpose and Living a Meaningful Life. And this this little post is just brilliant. Um, the, the, the key takeaway that I took from it um, that I would say to people is that when you are trying to design your life, focus um, rather than on setting goals, focus on the life that you'd like to have and then design your goals around that. So think about what life you want, because that should impact um, the, the goals that you set. Uh, in the way that you design your life. Uh, one other thing I will say, I, I've started reading uh, The Righteous Mind, Why Good People Are Divided, which um, you uh, brought up, Joe, in a previous show. Excellent recommendation. I'm very much enjoying it. Very cool. I'm going to jump in with a few picks here. Um, this episode, I believe, will go out. Well, it might not go out next week. Anyway, um, you'll notice that the schedule on the podcast releases has changed. Uh, these panel discussions are coming out on Tuesdays now instead of Wednesday. And there are, there's a new series coming out on Thursday on the same feed, and that is My JS Story. So, uh, so far I've talked to Joe Eames. I've also talked to Isaac Schluter and Michael Rogers. Um, Isaac is the, uh, a lot of people know him as Isaacs or IS, IZS. Um, he's uh, the CEO of NPM Inc. We've had him on the show before. Uh, Michael is the guy who runs the Node Foundation and helps all that stuff happen. So we can do awesome stuff on servers with Node. So uh, go check those out. It's, it's been a really fun project and I'm really enjoying just having these conversations with our past guests and current panelists. So, um, so yeah, let me know what else you want me to ask these folks. Uh, let me know what you think. And uh, yeah, um, I've recorded five or six now. So uh, yeah, looking forward to having those come out. And uh, I guess we'll go ahead and wrap this up. Oh, one other thing I want to shout out about. Um, the JS Remote Conf tickets are available. And we should have speakers announced pretty soon. So keep an eye out for that. Um, the call for proposals ends or ended on January 15th. So, you know, fair warning or sorry you missed it. But, yeah, um, that's another thing we've got going on. So, um, anyway, those are my picks. Uh I guess we'll have you on every week, Corey, but if people want to follow you on Twitter or see what you're doing, what do they do? You can find me on Twitter at HouseCore or I blog on Medium a lot. Just Google for Corey House. All right, good deal. We'll wrap this one up and we'll catch you all next week. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.